Next, Republican tax cut proposals. The final part of the Republicans' contract with America calls for $189 billion in tax cuts over five years. Tuesday, the House Rules Committee considered the parameters for debate of the legislation. Republican leaders have agreed to prevent the cuts from taking effect until Congress adopts a budget that projects a balanced budget by the year 2002. This hearing runs a little over two hours. This meeting of the Rules Committee will come to order for the uh, purpose of considering the uh, Contract with America Tax Relief Act of 1995. And um, let me just say at the outset, we've already held about nine hours of hearings uh, on this measure. Uh, the, uh, it's, in my opinion, an uh, extremely historic occasion. Uh, when you look at what's happened in this Congress over the last 100 days, uh, you can uh, thank um, this committee for much of that, that effort. Uh, and from the looks of your faces, uh, I can, uh, <laughs> I, I'm glad, uh, I think you're glad this 100 days is coming to an end. This is the last of the um, contract items. Uh, we only have to go back to uh, looking at the, uh, the very beginning of, uh, of this 100 days when we sought to, to shrink the size and the power of the federal government. We sought to uh, change the status quo from what it has been. Uh, and in doing so, the first thing we did was to bring the, uh, this United States Congress under the same laws that we, uh, we asked the American people to abide by. Uh, we passed a balanced budget amendment. Uh, unfortunately, um, we're one full vote short in the Senate, but uh, I'm very confident that we're going to pass that uh, before this Congress would adjourn uh, next year. Uh, we enacted an unfunded mandate bill, I think, which was uh, certainly a change from the status quo. We elected on, uh, we passed on Ronald Reagan's birthday, uh, our esteemed uh, great Republican president uh, on his birthday, the line item veto. And uh, hopefully when we get through with the conference of the, uh, uh, with the other body, uh, we're going to bring that back uh, to the House for final passage. We passed a national security bill which reduced the involvement of uh, this country in peacekeeping operations and in so-called nation building. We prohibited American troops from serving uh, under foreign command, something that means a lot to uh, all of us on this panel. We passed a tough crime bill, again, reversing the, the philosophy that this Congress knows best, that we're going to micromanage the lives of the American people. Uh, we passed a very meaningful regulatory reform dealing with risk assessments and cost analysis. And what that really means is that before this, uh, this uh, administration or any future administration can promulgate rules and regulations on the American people, be it business or industry or individuals, uh, we're going to have to prove that there is a risk there and that the cost is worth it if we're going to try to mandate, put a mandate on, uh, on local governments or state governments or uh, the private sector. We passed something that uh, has been very close to me since uh, I came here as a small entrepreneur businessman 16 years ago, uh, dealing with the tort reforms and product liability that will help to make this country once again competitive with all of the other uh, industrialized nations around the world. We dealt with uh, a completely complete change in the status quo in uh, comprehensive uh, welfare reform. And uh, today we are here. Uh, to enact meaningful spending cuts along with uh, tax cuts that will uh, hopefully turn this country around and uh, provide badly needed relief for, uh, for the family. Uh, having said all that, uh, the bill that is before us is a, um, I think, a, a uh, bill that is going to mean a lot. Uh, we hope to bring this bill up on the floor uh, through this rule tomorrow about 11.30 and finish it before uh, the day is out on Wednesday. Uh, and then this Congress can go home and uh, tell the American people uh, just what they have accomplished. And I think uh, having uh, seen all of the bipartisan support for this legislation, and if you look down at each one of the bills that I've uh, read off here today, 
um, the balanced budget amendment received 72 Democratic votes in bipartisan support. The line item veto, 71 Democrat votes in bipartisan support. And I could go right on down the line with every one of these issues that we've talked about today receiving strong bipartisan support. And we thank you, Democrats, here on this panel for your support uh, for this effort uh, for those that you may have voted for. Having said all that, let me yield to my very good friend, the ranking Democrat of the committee, John Joseph Moakley of Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As long as you're talking about putting things in line item, I wish you'd straighten out Reagan's picture. It's oh, yeah, way out of line. Did, you, did you put it up there? Oh, I tried in the stupid. midst of our hearing with a, co a colleague uh, testifying before the committee, uh, Mr. Bielenson saw fit to go over and take down that picture. Uh, and, uh, Terrible. He didn't mean to take it down. He was simply straightening it. All right. Mr. Chairman, the tax bill we're meeting on today has been called the crown jewel of the Republican contract. It marks the end of 100 days of hasty legislating and favors to special interests. And what exactly will this tax bill do? It will take money from school lunches, hand it over to the very rich in the form of tax breaks. That's right, from the mouths of babes to the pockets of billionaires. And this tax bill is not isolated in its favors to the powerful. There have been definite winners and losers during this uh, Republican Congress. Would the gentleman yield on that point, Mr. I'd like to finish. It's a very short uh, statement, David. The losers were child nutrition programs, summer jobs, education programs, and low-income housing, housing assistance, a program that is critical for a lot of Massachusetts families, the ones that I represent. And the winners, the winners are special interest lobbyists, corporations, millionaires who stay in the country, and billionaires who renounce their American citizenship to avoid paying taxes. The Republican Congress has passed a series of bills that are a special interest lobbyist dream. They take funding from nutrition programs and wink at the very rich. In fact, over one half of the tax cuts in this bill alone go to people making over $100,000 a year. So I must say to my Republican colleagues, I'm sorry to see so many flaws in your crown jewel, and I think the American people deserve better. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Moakley, if I might just respond uh, before yielding to my good friend David Dreyer that uh, uh, there, a vote began at uh, 259 on the Souter Amendment to the Family Privacy Protection Act. I think we will, um, we will recess this meeting rather than running it through when, we, when it comes time for the vote. But Joe, let me just say something. I tried to, in my opening remarks, uh, not to be uh, critical of the, of the other party. Um, we didn't want to get into a class warfare. Uh, I spoke of the bipartisan support that we've had on all of the other pieces of legislation, and I would like to submit this for the record without objection uh, to show the tremendous bipartisan support that we've had. And I just, uh, I'm not a betting man, but if I were, Joe, I'd bet you that uh, when this bill passes, there is going to be substantial bipartisan Democrat support for the bill because it is the right thing to do. It is a change in the status quo. Having said all that, let's recess this meeting and come back directly after the vote is over.
Mr. Buckley. Yeah, I have a, a statement I'd like to submit from the administration. It says the administration strongly opposes enactment of H.R. 1215 because it is fi financially, fiscally irresponsible and would provide the disproportionate tax benefits to the wealthy at the expense of the programs for the average American. If H.R. 1215 were presented to the president in its current form, the Secretary of the Treasurer and the Director of the OMB would recommend a veto. Without objection. Mr. Chairman. Uh, if the gentleman is, uh, I'm not going to recognize you for a motion because uh, it's not in order at this time, but I, I would be glad I to recognize the gentleman. Just for a very brief statement, sir, only because your opening statement was a little bit longer than Mr. Moakley, so I thought... It always is. Well, would you wait, uh, would you just uh, yes. uh, wait for one moment? Yes, because uh, I just have to respond to Mr. Moakley and point out that uh, uh, that's fine for President Clinton to say that this is irresponsible. Let me show you what's irresponsible around here. Haven't we seen this before, Mr. I Chairman? I think you might have, but uh, they're uh, the American people want to see Maybe it over and over and over. If you will just look at uh, line number one, that was the president's budget last year that he presented to this Congress. And in that presentation, he projected an accumulated additional deficit of $894 billion. That was last year, according to the president's own Office of Management and Budget figures. Then he came back this year with a new budget, a new five-year projection. And keep in mind that this has been going on now for year after year after year. Now he projects a, an accumulated deficit over just five years of almost a trillion dollars. And the uh, Congressional Budget Office comes in and tells us that each one of these years are underestimated by about $50 billion. So this figure is not an accumulated additional debt of a trillion dollars, but probably more like one trillion, two hundred and fifty billion dollars. That, my friends, is what is irresponsible around here. And that's why we are going to enact in this rule, which is before us in a few minutes, we are going to self-execute in that rule language, which is going to require that the none of these taxes will go into effect before this Congress enacts into law a reconciliation budget bill. Uh, which is going to require this Congress to finally balance this budget by the year 2002. I wish it could be by the year 2000, and uh, if I have anything to say about it, it will be. That's what's irresponsible. Now let me uh, yield to my good friend, Mr. Bielenson of California. I thank my friend from, from New York. If, if we were not to pass this bill, Mr. Chairman, as the gentleman knows, we could more easily do that by the year 2000 than by 2002. I just want to say one thing, if I might. As, as, as members on the other side know, there's, there's not an awful lot in, in amongst the bills which you all have been pushing the, the past three months or so to, to the liking of, of many of us. But I must say, uh, I think it's fair to say, certainly speaking for myself and I think for others, that there's been a certain amount of grudging admiration, at least for one part of what you all were trying to do, and that is to be apparently serious, and I, I, I know that the vast majority of you, as are the vast majority of folks on our side, serious about reducing the budget deficit. Um, you know, that, that was one, if I may put it, perhaps good outcome of, of, the, of the elections last year. And the problem, and I, I know that some members of the other side feel this at least partially, uh, but the, the, sad, the sad thing about this particular bill, of course, is that it, it does go in the opposite direction. Uh, the tax provisions in this bill represent the largest increase in the deficit in history, with the exception of the 1981 tax cuts. About $189 billion over the first five years, almost $700 billion over the next, over the, over the total 10 years. And quite obviously, Mr. Chairman, because you've spoken eloquently for, you know, again, as you often do, and, and with our approval, I think, about the need to, to reduce our, our, our budget deficits. It's a shame. Uh, the passage of this bill, as I suppose it, I suppose it will pass, will make that, that uh, very good goal that much more difficult. I hope perhaps somewhere along the way, either on the floor or, or perhaps over in the other body, that this bill may be changed, perhaps even defeated or dropped. Uh, it would be nice if we could just concentrate for a couple, three years on, on reducing spending and, and really get that deficit down to, to zero by the year 2000 or two or so. It's, this is going to make it very much more difficult for all of us. We're going to have to find a lot of additional spending to cut, and it's going to be difficult for, for all members on both sides. That's all I wanted to say, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the gentleman's points are well taken. Uh, Mr. Quillen, do you have a motion before this body? Mr. Chairman, I do, before I make the motion. I remember when President Clinton 
said he was going to help the uh, middle class people, the working man, and the tax increase, the greatest that this Congress has ever passed. And he was going to protect those classes of people. He didn't do it. And I think that the tax increase that was passed by President Clinton it was a sham, a disgrace to the, our economy. And I, 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 you know, they always talk about help for the rich. I don't buy that. But Mr. Chairman, let's get down to business. I do have a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a modified closed rule for the consideration of H.R. 1215, the contract with America Tax Relief Act of 1995. The rule waives all points of order against the bill. The rule provides four hours of general debate with two hours allocated to the Ways and Means Committee and one hour each to the Budget and Commerce Committee. The rule makes in order the text of H.R. 1327 as modified by the amendment printed in the committee report as the base bill for amendment purposes. All points of order against the amendment are waived. The rule makes an order one amendment in the nature of a substitute designated and reported by Representative Gephardt of Missouri, which is non amendable, is subject to one hour of debate. All points of order are waived against the Gephardt amendment. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instruction. I thank the gentleman. Is there any discussion on the motion? Mrs. Price. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I certainly commend the hard work uh, which you and the members of our leadership have put uh, forward toward uniting members behind this important tax relief package. The first time in years, the House will have the opportunity to vote on a comprehensive tax relief plan which is pro-family, pro-growth, and pro-job creation. Uh, therefore, I move this committee um, to make in order the amendment offered by the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Gansky, and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. Mr. Chairman, uh, after, after the gentlewoman has, has spoken, I would like to speak on that also. Thank you. Uh, the amendment, Mr. Chairman, simply calls for lowering the caps on family income for the $500 per child tax credit from $200,000 to $95,000. This amendment, if adopted by the House, will still cover 85% of the families in America and would also deliver an additional $12 to $14 billion in savings for deficit reduction. It had the support of uh, approximately 102 Republicans. And Mr. Chairman, much of the debate is centered around just what exactly is the middle class and how in monetary terms do we define it. Some say this debate is an, an engagement in class warfare, but I would submit, Mr. Chairman, that once we begin to use caps to define the middle class, we come closer to the America's, American people's idea of the middle class under the Gansky version than under the original contract language. The Gansky Amendment presents a workable middle ground between deficit reduction and real tax relief for middle income families. Many of my constituents back home and folks around the country support this reasonable, responsible approach to reducing federal spending and easing the tax burden on working families. Mr. Chairman, I urge support of this amendment so the House may have an opportunity to debate this issue. Thank Mr. You. Chairman. I thank the, uh, just a moment, uh, I thank the gentlelady for uh, her, uh, her amendment. <laughs> As she knows, I, uh, I share uh, some of her view uh, concerning this matter. I happen to be one of those members that, uh, that signed a letter uh, many of us signed the letters for uh, many different reasons. Some because they thought it was more fair. Uh, others, like myself, who felt that uh, the magnitude of the tax cut, uh, other than the capital gain tax cut, which would stimulate the economy, uh, was something that we just could not afford. And uh, this would have saved considerable dollars in the, uh, in the tax cuts. However, we do have an obligation, I feel, to try to bring our contract for America to the floor for a debate. There, uh, I know there are arguments on both sides of this issue that uh, this would not, that your amendment in particular would not violate the, uh, the contract. Others say it would. Uh, and I guess that uh, that's, can, can be discussed. But um, I do believe that uh, when we get into uh, negotiations with the Senate that, uh, that certainly uh, 
some change might be made in the in the present cap of 200,000 as provided here. The other reason that I have concern over it personally is that um, if we were to allow this amendment to be open, offered on the floor, it would only be fair then to allow an amendment by the other side of the story, uh, namely a Mr. Doolittle of California had asked for an amendment to be made in order that would remove the cap entirely and just say what's fair for one is fair for all. And uh, uh, that also makes a lot of sense. Uh, however, if we were to make those two amendments in order, and I have here a list of uh, about 50 other amendments, and I'm told that there were uh, perhaps another 50 or more that uh, have not been filed with us, but members uh, knowing that it would not be uh, opened up for uh, uh, general amendments, uh, didn't bother to offer their amendments. Uh, we would have to take those into consideration. Mr. Hansen has a, an amendment which uh, oh. I uh, support, which would uh, take into, into consideration the, the uh, health benefits, uh, which are not the health benefits, the pension benefits that we're dealing with for federal employees. And his amendment would say that it would not affect existing employees that are on the payroll today, but it would only be prospective. Uh, that's an amendment if we open this up, to, uh, open the tax code up to all of these kinds of amendments that ought to be considered. But I would just point out uh, that uh, under former Democrat uh, uh, control and now under Republican control, the minority, we Republicans in the minority, uh, did support uh, not allowing uh, amendments to be offered to the United States tax code that had not had in-depth hearings because it could jeopardize the amount of revenues coming into the federal government. And considering the terrible deficits we have today, we just can't afford that. And for all of those reasons, I would uh, respectfully, although I have great sympathy for the amendment, I would respectfully have to oppose it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I think Mr. Mr. The, the, the uh, ranking member would like to be recognized, if that's all right with the, with the gentleman. Mr. Chairman, I support this motion to give you an opportunity to make an order. The amendment that you wrote to yourself about uh, to four weeks ago, and I hope you have decided to allow the members of the committee and the House a chance to vote on this issue. issue. I've just told the gentleman I did not support it. I you know, but, I, I, but, the, but it's different to allow people to, to vote on it. Oh, I see. Uh, when 102 members of your own party ask you for a vote on the amendment, I think that you would listen to them and grant their request. Last Thursday, some of the Republican members of the committee expressed solid support for the amendment. And I know you're under a great deal of pressure to report this rule out, uh, this rule without this amendment, but I think uh, because of your letter and the testimony that I've heard, uh, I think it's only fair that it be made in order. Well, we'll take the gentleman's uh, feelings into uh, consideration as we uh, proceed Always through do. this debate. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. Um, I would suggest to the gentleman that he may want to, in the future, consider not writing himself letters uh, if he is not able to persuade himself of a particular uh, point of view. Well, uh, but uh, he would have paid more attention, not, he, but he didn't sign it. Uh, uh, but I, I do, I do want to make one observation. Um, you have, of course, permitted an amendment uh, by self-executing a version of the uh, Castle Browder amendment uh, into this rule. Um, so that um, it's, it's not like you're not permitting any amendments. You're only permitting amendments under certain circumstances. And uh, Mrs. Price's amendment, of course, could be treated in the same way. If you're concerned about uh, uh, floor votes and disturbing the sanctity of closed rules, you could self-execute her amendment into the original text, uh, just as you have done with this other matter. Um, I just think that her amendment is a very good one. And uh, I intend to vote for it. Uh, it clearly draws the issue as to whether or not the tax relief will go to the middle class or whether the tax relief will go to people earning up to $200,000. And it's an amendment that the House should have the opportunity to vote on on the floor. Well, I would just, before yielding to my good friend, uh, Mr. Dreyer of California, I would just point out, number one, that the, uh, the amendment that we are self-executing into the rule does not... Uh, affect the, the tax, does not change the tax code. What it simply says is the budget will, uh, we will enact a balanced budget reconciliation bill before the tax cuts can take effect. We're going to do that uh, by, the, by September 30th of this year. I, I, understand, I understand, but the gentleman was concerned uh, in his remarks, expressed concern about opening this legislation up to amendment on the floor. 
uh, and uh, express the view that this committee, and uh, when the Democrats were in control, uh, reported out closed rules and that he was following the same precedent. Mm -hmm. uh, I just suggest to you that uh, you are uh, doing also something that the Democrats did when we were in control, which was to say that you were having a, con a closed rule and yet ma managing to get around that by self-executing an amendment into the rule. Did I mean, you everybody Democrats do that? Everybody should be clear. Uh, and it's interesting, I I've been asked by reporters in the last couple of weeks about uh, has the Rules Committee changed now that the Republicans are in control? Or is it the same type of Rules Committee it was when the Democrats were in control? And what I've said is that nothing has changed except the names of the players, is that the Republican majority is being every bit as creative and every bit as uh, innovative in the type uh, restrictive rules that it reports as the Democrats ever thought of when we were in control of the committee. Well, I would, let me just say to the gentleman, I, I don't want to uh, drag this on because we are under the gun. We have to file this report before the Congress adjourns today, and they are, uh, I understand, have finished their business. But uh, let me just say that uh, uh, I have to take exception to what the gentleman says. The welfare bill, which we just uh, spent uh, uh, many hours of debate, uh, your minority leader came to this committee and asked that we put out a closed rule that uh, we not allow, oh, we allow only two substitutes uh, from the Democrats, not three or four or five, which had be re been requested by your side of the aisle, and that no amendments be made in order to any of those. Uh, we saw fit to be three times as fair as the Democrats have been in the past. I keep telling my good friend sitting next to me. Uh, and we, we made... We uh, all know you can't count those. We, we, we not only made, uh, made those two substitutes in order, but we also made 40 amendments in order uh, to go along with it. So it's a question of, of trying to be fair, and I think that's proven by the chart which I... Uh, I uh, Mitch, Mitch, Mitch. showed a few minutes ago, which I'd like to submit for the record, uh, which showed the tremendous bipartisan support we've had from conservative Democrats throughout the entire debate of this past moderate, moderate Democrats days. too, Matt. Excuse the, me, uh, moderate Democrats, and, also. including you, I think, uh, voted for several Mr. of these. Mr. So, Chairman, if we I appreciate that very much. If I may have 30 seconds, 30 um, seconds, and then we'll move the, on. The uh, welfare reform rule that was reported was more innovative, more creative. Uh, and more unusual than anything the Democrats ever did because you laid open your substitute, you then you, your bill, then you had substitutes, then you opened your, amend, your substitute for amendment the second time. We never did anything that unusual when we were in control. Well, I thank you for the flattery. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> might I please move on? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, just... Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Frost was talking about uh, you promised the contract be fair and open debate. Uh, so making this uh, amendment in order would really fulfill your, your promise. Just well, we're, we're delivering on 95 percent. We'll try to make it 96 before the day's over. Thank uh, you. Mr. Uh, Dreyer, Thank California. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief because we do want to charge ahead here. But with all due respect to my 102 colleagues who signed that letter, including the chairman and Ms. Price and others, it seems to me that this amendment goes right to the base of the whole class warfare issue. I don't believe there should be a cap at all. I believe that the child of a family who's come from a household with an income of 95000 should have the same worth as one coming from a family with an income of $200,000. And so for that reason, I'm inclined to uh, oppose this amendment, uh, believing sincerely that the us versus them argument which has been very pervasive. Vice President Gore was carrying it on on television this morning, and many people on the House floor have been pushing this, is, uh, I believe, uh, counter to the whole basis of our, uh, of our contract and what it is that we're trying to do. And when we've put together a bipartisan spirit on a number of measures, it has been because there's been recognition of the fact that it's important for us to stick together, and to proceed, yeah. proceed to the benefit of all Americans. And I would say also <clears throat> that the argument that's been used claiming this is somehow going to be a great loss of revenues to the Treasury is, I believe, off base. I know that we have this question over dynamic scoring, but very clearly the reduction in the capital gains tax rate, which is an integral part of this plan, is going to benefit not only farmers, small businessmen and women, working people who have some sort of appreciated assets, but at the same time, 
it is going to increase revenues to the federal treasury based on every shred of empirical evidence that we have of past performance. And so for that reason, I'm convinced that this measure will be key to our deficit reduction package. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> the gentleman's points are well taken. Is there further discussion on the price amendment? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goss. Thank you. I know I, you don't want to delay any further, nor do I. But there, I did sign the letter, and I signed it as a point of preference at the time, because I wanted to send the message that we should focus on spending first, spending limitations. That's where a big part of the problem has been. Uh, and I think there's a lot of appeal in, uh, in the um, gentlewoman from Ohio's uh, amendment today. But we have a contract with America. As you said at the beginning, this is the last item. It's the last item on the menu. We need to get it served up. Uh, and I can count very well. And I understand that we are going to get this rule out there and we are going to get it passed uh, and we are going to do it in the form that it's in. I can do that with a good conscience because I know that we are going to deal with the whole question of tax reform in the next 265 days. I think it's going to make the first 100 days look simple. But I am looking forward for the next 265 days to accomplishing some of the rest of the agenda that we are going to be talking about as we go through many of the good ideas we heard in our hearings process on this rule. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there further discussion uh, on the Price Amendment? If not, all those in favor of the Price Amendment will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. Nay. Evidently, the nays have it, roll and the call. amendment is not agreed to, and a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Quillen? Oh. Quillen votes no, Mr. Dreyer? No. Mr. Dreyer votes no, Mr. Goss? No. Mr. Goss votes no, Mr. Lender? No. Lender votes no, Mr. Price? Aye. Mr. Price votes aye. Mr. Diaz-Balart? No. Mr. Diaz-Balart votes no, Mr. Price? Aye. Mr. Price votes no, Mr. Diaz -Balart. No. Mr. Diaz -Balart. no. Mr. Guinness? No. Mr. Guinness votes no, Mr. Walpole? Aye. Mr. Walpole votes aye. Mr. Mobley? Aye. Mr. Mobley? Aye. Mr. Bokley votes aye. I'm, I'm waiting on the chairman, actually. Mr. Bielenson votes aye. Mr. Frost aye. Mr. Frost votes aye. Mr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Hall votes aye. Chairman Solomon? No. Chairman Solomon votes no. The clerk will announce the results. Six yeas and seven nays. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the uh, gentleman's motion from Tennessee? Yes, sir. Mr. Mokley. I think you sent me looking for those paper clips so you could get by me. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I sat there, there was always paper clips there, Mr. Moakley, and uh, I wish you'd put them back. I was never a paper clip <laughs> Uh Mr. Chairman, uh, I have an amendment to the rule. My amendment would allow any member to demand a division of the question and have a separate vote on titles two and five of the bill. The provisions of the bill which were contained in the Senior Citizen Equity Act Thank impact you. senior citizens and by allowing a separate and by allowing a separate vote, Congress will have the opportunity to demonstrate our commitment to the senior citizens. <clears throat> Mr. Moakley, I will just say that um, in the uh, the tax cut package, which is the uh, second part of the two-part bill dealing with spending cuts and tax cuts, that what we are doing is uh, we are restoring uh, the, uh, or I should say we are repealing uh, the tax penalty that was placed on senior citizens last year in President Clinton's bill. As a matter of fact, we held a press conference out on the steps earlier today about it, and uh, I'd be glad to yield to my good friend Porter Goss to... Uh, uh, tell us about that if he cares to. I think that one of the things we've done in this, particularly in, in this legislation, is to try and provide some relief for seniors. The earnings test limitations, as well, some of the uh, insurance provisions which are provided for, uh, which we have been frankly asking for, as you will recall in previous mm -hmm. Congresses, we're finally moving forward. Uh, I'm not sure what the purpose of, of, uh, uh, of your amendment would be. Uh, I think we've done a great job of uh, highlighting the, the, the sore spots for our seniors, uh, and I think we've uh, got them included in this bill. Gentleman Neal? Surely. Uh, the purpose of my amend amendment is to get a separate vote on this. A lot of people don't completely agree with the entire bill, but a lot of people do agree uh, on this amendment, so that's the reason for these, the uh, amendment uh, uh, to be singled out by itself. Well, I can, if, reclaiming my time, I can't imagine anybody not wanting to be senior friendly. So I suspect that uh, if we do not pass this amendment, we are still going to provide exactly the kind of relief that the seniors have been asking us for that we've been forestalled in achieving uh, in past Congresses. 
Could oh, I ask why was, it was uh, General Neal, it was, in, it was uh, introduced in the contract as a separate uh, uh, matter. The, the, the contract was that we would provide relief for the seniors, and in the crafting of the legislation to move it forward, we have obviously uh, put it in this package. Oh. But it didn't. It, well, we're running out of packages to put it in. This is the last one. Well, I think. Um, have we had enough discussion? <laughs> I, I'd be very. You know. Well, I mean, it's very clear what the amendment does, and that's what we're discussing. Yeah. Any further discussion? If not, on the uh, Moakley Amendment, uh, all those in favor will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. And the amendment is not agreed to. Roll call. And a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Quillen? No. Quillen votes no. Mr. Dreyer? No. Mr. Dreyer votes no. Mr. Goss? No. Mr. Goss votes no. Mr. Leonard? No. Mr. Leonard votes no. Mr. Price? No. Mr. Price votes no. Mr. Piazza Bellard? No. Mr. Piazza Bellard votes no. Mr. Jones? No. Mr. Guinness votes no. Mr. Walton votes no. Mr. Walton votes no. Mr. Walton votes no. No. Clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the uh, gentleman from Tennessee's motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a number of amendments Mr. to the Mr. Frost. As we have heard, the Republican leadership has agreed to a provision amending the tax bill which will allow the tax cuts to take effect when the Congress completes work on a long-term budget to eliminate the deficit. Mr. Chairman, you and I both know this agreement is a fig leaf, a diversionary tactic designed to get enough votes to pass this last portion of the contract. If we are really going to be serious about balancing the budget around here, now is as good a time as any to start. Instead of promises, which may or may not uh, be able to be kept. I would like to propose that the House have the opportunity to vote on three amendments relating to real deficit reduction in tax cuts. Accordingly, Mr. Chairman, I would like to offer an amendment to the rule which would allow the consideration of an amendment I have submitted to the committee uh, and which would provide appropriate waivers. This amendment is very simple. It says none of the proposed tax cuts can take effect until the federal budget has been in balance for one year. We, have, we had ample discussion about this and other amendments last week when the committee held its hearing on this legislation. But I would like to reiterate for the record, Mr. Chairman, that this amendment will allow the members of the House to put their money where their rhetoric is. I move adoption of the amendment. Um, Mr. Dreyer, yes, if I could just uh, ask for a clarification. Uh, is that the Browder Amendment? No, this is the Frost Amendment. The Frost, Frost amendment. number one. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I vigorously oppose this amendment for a number of reasons. Mr. Quillen, in his opening remarks, talked about the fact that President Clinton argued in his 1992 campaign in behalf of middle class tax cut and it's taken a Republican Congress to help him keep that campaign promise that he made. It also has to be recognized, as I said earlier, that this tax package is an integral part of our effort to balance the budget. Clearly, increasing revenues to the Treasury is a goal that we have. And while I acknowledge that the $500 per child tax credit and a number of other items are not going to provide the kind of economic stimulus that we need to increase the flow of revenues to the Treasury, it seems to me that we do need to realize that there are very important aspects to this bill which will help us on the road towards a balanced budget. And my friend from Texas knows very well that this is a goal that many on his side of the aisle have and clearly all the Republicans have. We want to move in the direction of balancing the budget. We're going to do it, but the American people also should have some benefit accrued from this uh, effort that we have put together over the past uh, 92 days. And it seems to me that as we uh, proceed with this, we're going on the road. Next month, we will be unveiling from the Budget Committee the most dramatic package that has come forward in this town in probably a half a century, looking at the elimination of several cabinet-level agencies and a wide range of other changes. Uh, he knows that we are on the road to do that. The American people should benefit at the same time, and I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. I would only respond that the gentleman's position is addition by subtraction. He wants to add to federal revenues by subtracting from federal revenues. It's a very interesting concept, and I insist on my amendment. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a concept that I should say has proved to be successful every single time that it has been done going all the way back to the days of Warren G. Harding, it going was all the way to the days of John F. Kennedy, all the way to the days of Ronald Reagan, and while my friend from California talked about the decrease 
in revenues we actually saw during the 1980s, following the 1981 Economic Recovery Tax Act's implementation, a dramatic increase in the flow of revenues to the Treasury. The problem was spending. The gentleman has insisted on his amendment. Uh, all those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. No. Nay. The amendment is not agreed roll to. Roll call, Mr. Chairman. And a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Will in votes no, Mr. Price. Dreyer votes no, Mr. Goss. No. Goss votes no, Mr. Linder. No. Linder votes no, Ms. Price. No. Ms. Price votes no, Mr. Diaz-Villart. No. Mr. Diaz-Villart votes no, Mr. McGinnis. No. Mr. McGinnis votes no, Mrs. Walpole. No. Mrs. Walpole votes no, Mr. Mopley. Yes. Mopley votes yes, Mr. Bielans. Yes. Mr. Bielans votes yes, Mr. Frost. Yes. Mr. Frost votes yes, Mr. Hall. Yes. Mr. Hall votes yes, Mr. Solomon. No. The clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments yes. to the res to the Mr. Gentleman's motion? Mr. Chairman, I have two, and I'll move through them rather quickly so that we can do them before the roll call. Oh, vote. All right. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of Mr. Browder, I would like to offer an amendment number 19, which provides for a timetable for meeting deficit reduction goals. These goals must be met in order for the tax cuts in this legislation to t take effect and stay in effect. As we have discussed, the Republican members who originally co-sponsored this amendment with Mr. Browder have now agreed to support an amendment which, in my opinion, does nothing but provide Republican members cover. Mr. Chairman, we are not here to find cover. We are here to do the people's business. I believe Mr. Browder had, has a very serious amendment which addresses the deficit, and this amendment should have the opportunity to be considered by the House, regardless of the agreement made between your leadership and other Republican members who originally joined with Mr. Browder. I move the adoption of the amendment. Well, I would just say to the gentleman uh, that he knows I had uh, concern about this. I was one of those negotiating with uh, the Republican leadership of which I am a part of. Uh, trying to get uh, language built in that would guarantee us that we are going to finally reach a balanced budget in this Congress. The, uh, the language that does uh, appear in this rule that will be self-executed and, and added to the base text of the bill says that, quote, the concurrent resolution on the budget for fiscal year 1996 as agreed to provided, provides that the budget of the United States will be in balance by fiscal year 2002, and it goes on to explain how this will be written into law. Uh, and in order for the Congress to renege on this, it's going to take an act by the Congress voting on the floor of Congress to rescind this legislation. But I that, was, that was just a minute, please. Yeah. Uh, that was good enough for me, and uh, I consider myself to be the prime deficit hawk in the Congress, and I think the gentleman would agree to that. And if it's good enough for me, it ought to be good enough for the rest of us. The, uh, the gentleman who is my you, friend, the, the, ge the gentleman who is my friend uh, has uh, softened as he has become a member of the Republican leadership and may not qualify for the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Hawk Supremus uh, title anymore. Will you tell me what part of him is soft? <laughs> uh, I, would, um, I would insist upon my amendment. The gentleman insists on his amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. Nay. The amendment is not agreed to. Roll call. Roll and call. A roll, roll call, call is requested. The, the clerk will call the roll. Uh, Mr. Yes. Yes. No. And the um, clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Yes, I have one additional amendment. If there is, uh, we can entertain that motion if, uh, if we can make the debate brief. It will be brief. We have not much time left. My next vote. amendment, Mr. Chairman, is a proposal offered by Mrs. Harmon of California, number 36. This amendment is a follow-on to the amendment agreed to by the House during the consideration of the rescission bill. That amendment, authored by Mr. Brewster, created a lockbox for savings from discretionary domestic rescissions. That amendment was agreed to by Mr. Chairman by a vote of 418 to 5. Given that the the House has so overwhelmingly voted in favor of using those savings for deficit reduction. I think it is only fair to give the House the opportunity to express its will on what to do with the savings contained in this legislation. This is another serious effort to address deficit reduction and deserves the opportunity to be fully debated by the House. I move adoption of the amendment. You've heard the gentleman's uh, explanation of the amendment. Is there any discussion uh, to Mr. it? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, I know we're under a uh, deadline to get down and vote. Uh, I think a lot of the concern about the lockbox, which we have discussed before, has been taken care of. Uh, by the way we are handling the rule with um, the 
discussed in the previous amendment, uh, the Castle uh, Upton effort, uh, we are making sure that we are taking care of the deficit. And that is the goal. The mechanism we use is the question that the gentleman has raised this amendment. I think we already have a mechanism provided for in the legislation uh, that's out there, and I see no need for this amendment for another mechanism. If there is no further discussion on the gentleman's amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed will say nay. Oh. Nay. And the amendment is not agreed to. Hey, the amendment is, the amendment is not Chairman. agreed roll to. Roll call, Mr. Chairman. Oh, are you insisting yes, on a roll call in spite oh, yes. of the uh, lateness of the, yes. we'll, of the we'll hour talk of the vote? Fast. We'll talk Clerk will call the roll. Announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. A vote uh, began at uh, 347 on the floor of Congress on a Dornan amendment to prevent surveys to minors. Uh, this committee will, will reconvene uh, two minutes after the end of that vote. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee make an order of the amendment number 23, offered by Representatives Kennedy of Massachusetts and Burton, and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The amendment excludes employee adoption assistance benefits and military personnel adoption assistance benefits from taxable income. It adds non-reoccurring adoption expenses to the list of items for which withdrawals from IRAs can be made without tax of penalty and clarifies tax exempt status of adoption assistant payments uh, for, for special needs children. Mr. Chairman, uh, this would be a, a great uh, uh, bipartisan amendment. I think members could support it. Uh, uh, it improves upon the $5,000 adoption tax credit and other adoption incentives that are already contained in the bill. And, and we all know the high cost of adoption and care for foster care children is above the means of the average American people, but with some additional help, we can move many of these children out of the system and into loving homes. The fiscal impact of this amendment would be minimal while the benefits of getting children out of foster care into loving homes just can't be measured. So I think, Mr. Chairman, anything we can do uh, to make the adoption easier for families who want to adopt uh, has a direct impact on reducing the number of abortions that are performed in this country. If an expectant mother knows that her unwanted child has a good chance of being adopted, then she will be less likely to have an abortion. I think the time has come to bring this amendment to a vote in the House. I would just say to the gentleman, uh, there is uh, another amendment uh, pending which uh, deals with the same subject matter. Does the gentleman uh, care to put those in, in, in block? Do you intend to offer the Bunning Amendment as well? No. You do not intend to? Okay. Not, not at this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was that about, David? <laughs> well, let me uh, just say to the gentleman. The gentleman knows I have great sympathy for this uh, this issue. I was uh, adopted myself, and uh, uh, it's an area that uh, we are looking into. Mr. Bunning from Kentucky has a. Uh, similar amendment dealing with uh, the same kind of subject matter, and I would hope that uh, that the Ways and Means Committee would take this issue up, hold hearings uh, appropriately on it, and uh, and perhaps uh, bring it back to this committee and uh, in due diligence. And uh, uh, we are again. There are many amendments like this, many of which are good amendments, but. Uh, if we open up the tax code to this one, then we ought to do it for others as well, and I just don't feel that we can do that. Would so I would urge defeat of the gentleman's amendment. Mr. Chairman, would you write me a letter on that? I'd be more than glad to. Okay. I'll even sign it. All right. <laughs> on the motion, Mr. Chairman. All those in favor of the Mokley Amendment will say aye. Aye. All those opposed will say nay. Uh, the amendment uh, is roll not call. agreed to. The gentleman insists on a roll call on all of these. Does I don't the insist. I'm just asking for oh, a roll okay. call. Well, the gentleman respectfully asks for a roll call. Thank you. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Willard? No. 
Will and votes no, Mr. Dreyer. No. Dreyer votes no, Mr. Goss. No. Goss votes no, Mr. Lender. No. Lender votes no, Mr. Price. No. Mr. Price votes no, Mr. Gaspar. No. Mr. Gaspar votes no. Yes. Gaines votes no, Mr. Walton. No. Mr. Walton votes no, Mr. Yes. Mobley votes yes. Mobley votes yes. Mr. Beelins, yes. Mr. Beelins votes yes. Mr. Frost. Yes. Frost votes yes. Mr. Walton. Yes. yes. All the votes yes. Chairman Fowler. No. Clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the gentleman's motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Who said that? No, Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall. Sorry, I didn't. Mr. Chairman, There's I have an echo an in the room with so many people here. I have an amendment. It's uh, numbered uh, 34. It's being offered by Representative Wolf, Moran, Davis, Hoyer, Morella, Norton. Which, and this uh, is the amendment. Uh, where does that appear on his sheet? There? Number six. On it's number six on our sheet. It's uh, number 34, I guess, on the under the original mm -hmm. sheet. This is the amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman, that um, that you have incorporated within this rule and this bill dealing with uh, federal pensions. And what we propose to do with this amendment is strike that provision because we, we believe it's wrong. We believe uh, that this, in fact, is, is very much a, a tax increase on federal workers. We've, uh, we've made a contract with them many, many times, as recent as 1983, when uh, we uh, had that major overhaul of the federal pension program. And we said at that time that we, in fact, would not go after the federal pensions again. And the fact is that this is a very unfair tax on them. We have a lot of letters that have, uh, that have come in on this from a lot of members. This is just one of them. I'll just read a paragraph. It says a two point, this is a 2.5% payroll tax increase for federal workers. It does not belong in the bill. Uh, for federal employees earning $30,000 a year, Title IV represents an additional $750 in taxes. These provisions unfairly penalize almost 2 million federal workers, postal employees, FBI agents, civilian military personnel. No other group of Americans will have its pay reduced by this bill. And there's just a lot of letters here from uh, members on, on your side, members on our side. The fact is, is that this is probably the only place in the Congress that we're going to get to debate this and, and probably even have a vote on this amendment because if you don't allow it up on the floor of the House, it would be a shame. This bill, or this idea came in trying to take this particular aspect out of the bill of the Committee of Jurisdiction. It was debated. Republicans and Democrats felt at the time that it was unfair. They couldn't even bring it to a vote, as I remember. So a full debate hasn't even come up on this. So to allow this, to allow this major change, which is essentially a tax increase on our federal employees to go to the floor of the House, without a vote on it, without even a debate on it, would be terrible. And I, I think it's, it's unnecessary. So my amendment, what it does, it strikes that provision, takes it out, puts the system right back where it is today. If we need to address the system, then let's address it in the proper committee of jurisdiction. Let's not change it without a vote, without a debate. And so I offer that amendment, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me say uh, to the gentleman, I know he offers it in, in all sincerity, and I know it's not um, a politically motivated uh, amendment on the part of the gentleman. He's one of the most respected members of, of this, uh, this panel and, uh, and of this House. And I share a lot, of, uh, a lot of his concerns on this issue, and I have discussed it with the, uh, not only the Republican leadership, the entire Republican conference, and members on your side of the aisle as well. Um, Unfortunately, it is being construed as uh, taxing one group of Americans in order to give tax reliefs to other, others. And that is too bad. Uh, it's being construed that way because it is in the two merged bills. If we were considering the, the spending cut bill on its own, of course, that wouldn't be the case. Uh, the problem is, in uh, allowing this amendment to pass, it would then mean that the, um, that the tax cuts would not be paid for. Um, my argument has been that uh, uh, if the 
federal retirement system, which includes uh, not only federal employees that you have mentioned, but also uh, congressional staff and members of Congress as well, uh, if that system is uh, actuarially unsound, then we certainly ought to be holding hearings and we certainly ought to be dealing with it. One of the great uh, uh, tragedies of this entire Congress and the United States government is that we have never uh, properly uh, funded the trust funds that, uh, that exist. The Social Security uh, Supplemental Security Trust Fund, which is the monthly check that uh, people age 62 or older receive uh, uh, through a forced savings account, has never been uh, actually uh, funded by taking the, uh, the contributions from employers and employees and placing them in the trust fund and then invested in Wall Street uh, like other retirement systems in the private sector have, have done. If, in fact, the contributions from all of the federal retirees, including Congress and members of Congress, had been placed uh, in that fund and had been properly invested, uh, this, the system would not be some $400 billion uh, in uh, actuarially out of balance now. And that's just a terrible tragedy. We're going to have to deal with this. However, uh, in making the amendment of, uh, in order on this bill, and, and should it be adopted, it would mean that we would not be living up to the, uh, to the uh, uh, promise that we would pay for any kind of tax cuts that were there. Now, having said all that, to be practical about it, I do not believe that this, uh, that this bill, uh, the two merge bills, the spending cuts and the tax cuts, are going to become law. I don't think this bill will become law. I think from the uh, conversations that we've had and that uh, has been made public uh, to the press, uh, that the other body does intend to uh, revisit this entire issue. As a matter of fact, I think Mr. Quillen has a letter from, uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, Cage, uh, Casey uh, saying that he intends to hold further hearings and to revisit this issue and that this will not be the final vote on this issue. And for that reason, I am going to very reluctantly uh, oppose your amendment, even though I do not believe that this bill should be a part of the, uh, of the omnibus legislation before us today. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Frost, I think, has the time. Mr. Chairman, this really is an extraordinary exchange. Uh, first of all, the Committee of Jurisdiction did not report this piece of the legislation. This is a major rewrite of the federal retirement system, and the committee that has jurisdiction over this matter was unable to act, and yet this was grafted onto this piece of legislation by the Republican leadership. And Mr. Chairman, again, I have the highest regard for you, but for you to say, King's X, don't worry about it, we're really not going to do it, it really doesn't count, it's going to go away, that's not the way Congress legislates, and that's not the way people can, members of Congress can be held accountable. Would the gentleman I mean, let, 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 let me finish the statement, if I may, and then, mm. uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a piece of legislation that we're going to vote on on the floor tomorrow. And as my colleague from Ohio pointed out, this probably, this vote that we're about to take in the next minute or two, probably will be the only vote on this issue uh, while this legislation is moving, while this piece of legislation is moving through Congress. And the members, your members, the members on the other side of the aisle, this will be your only opportunity to be recorded on this issue. Your leadership is not giving you another chance to be recorded on this very vital question. And how you vote on right now in this committee is how all the federal retirees in the country will, will judge what your position is on whether their system should be changed or not. Now, the chairman says, oh, don't worry about it. It'll get fixed later on. Uh, it'll be okay. Everybody can, you all just stay in line right now, and this will be worked out later on in the process. Well, it may or may not be worked out later on in the process, and this will... This will be the only vote in the House of Representatives at this particular juncture on this very vital issue. Uh, we don't know what will happen once this goes to, a, uh, goes to the Senate and goes to a conference committee. Uh, we have to assume that, what we, that votes we take do matter and that the House position does matter on issues and that we don't know. You can't, you can't bind your leadership right now, Jerry. You can't say that your leadership, that the Speaker or that whoever handles this matter in conference won't insist that this provision remain in the bill. 
and that we will never then have another vote on this matter. I think it is, it is, is misleading your own members to suggest that this, this vote that we're about to take doesn't really matter, doesn't count. Well, yes. Uh, isn't it true that uh, Mr. Kasich doesn't have any authority over the federal pensions anyway? No, and uh, I don't know who will be in charge of the conference on this particular piece of legislation. I assume it would be uh, Mr. Archer would be the, uh, the chairman of the House conferees when this particular legislation goes to conference, not Mr. Kasich. If, uh, if I might uh, claim some time for myself, let me first of all uh, say to my good friend Mr. Frost, I did not say in any way that this, uh, this issue uh, would go away. Uh, this issue will not go away, nor should it go away. There are some serial, serious actuarial problems uh, with the retirement system today, and it must be dealt with. Uh, secondly, I just have to take exception to your statement that uh, this will be the only vote on this issue. This absolutely will not be the only vote on this issue, whether or not uh, anybody wants it to be or not. Uh, the truth of the matter is that this Congress is going to have to take up not only a budget uh, Bill, as the gentleman knows, who served on the Budget Committee for many years, but we will be involved in a major, major reconciliation act. Uh, and when this bill comes back from the Congress, uh, that's what we're going to be dealing with. All of this measure, whether it deals with tax cuts or spending cuts, are going to be in the Reconciliation Act that we will be voting on. That will be the real vote on this issue. Now, having said that, let me just point out that uh, Uh, this, this measure does also affect, as I said, members of uh, Congress. Um, and by my calculations, having read the reform that's in the bill, it means that each one of you will be contributing an additional $2,100 uh, to, to your pension plan. And I think we have to keep that in mind as we vote on this issue that uh, uh, we are a part of that plan and uh, we, uh, we are included and will be subject to whatever the, uh, the reforms are that we are placing on, on other federal employees. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, clearly. Uh, if I could, could, could I please, uh, I'd like to yield to Chairman Emeritus, if I might. Uh, sure. He's very concerned about this measure, and Jim Quiller. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am concerned. As a matter of fact, when the members, uh, Mr. Wolf and his group, appeared before this committee, I ask that my name be added to the amendment. The amendment being offered does not have my name, but that doesn't mean anything to me. I think the measure is unfair, but keeping that in mind, I'm a realist. The vote, Mr. Frost, that you're talking about will only be in the committee because this amendment is not going to be passed by this committee, in my opinion. That's exactly right, Mr. Quillen, that so since it won't be passed. The 13-member thir vote here is going to matter one iota. <laughs> but be that as it may, let me go further. That I had a conference with the speaker this morning. I've been fighting so to I'm win, to not to lose. And uh, he assured me that Mr. Klinger and Mr. Casey would hold further hearings on this particular item, and it will hold additional hearings as we continue to work on the matter. And I have a letter dated today from Kasich and Bill Klinger, both who have promised to hold hearings on this matter. I think generally everybody considered it unfair. I do. But being a realist, what do we do? Seems to me if we want to win, you're putting your cards on the basket here that's going to lose. We must trust the hearings and make our case in the hearing. We must go to the Senate and make a fight in the Senate. And then when in May or before September, when we go further in, in the legislative process, then we've got to make our case. Right now we're, I think the gentleman from uh, Texas realizes that the cards are stacked against this amendment in this committee. M Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may briefly respond, um, there is a senator from my state uh, who is a candidate for another office right now in your party. 
uh, who likes to say we're shooting with real bullets. Well, you're shooting with real bullets right now on this amendment because if this provision stays in the bill, if we are, if Mr. Hall is unsuccessful and there is no separate vote on this matter on the floor, this provision stays in this bill. Whenever this bill passes the Senate and goes to conference, then if Mr. Archer insists that this provision stay in the bill in conference, and we don't know whether Mr. Archer will or not, but if he does, if he insists on the House position, then that becomes law. If that's signed by the President, that 2.5% increase in what federal retirees will pay, uh, federal employees will pay toward their system becomes law. Now, when we were in the majority, we used to hold up letters from committee chairs saying we're going to hold hearings. And as I recall, members on your side kind of scoffed at that. Uh, kind of said those, well, that's very fine and dandy that you've got a letter from the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, or you've got a chairman from the Energy and Commerce Committee, that, that subsequent hearings are going to be held on that, but that doesn't make any difference because this is on a fast track to become law. And we should not delude ourselves nor delude the public that what we are about to do doesn't count. It does count because this will be the only recorded vote on this issue for a very long time and may be the only recorded vote between now and the time that this provision becomes law. Mr. Quillen has the time. Uh, you know, this is just the norm, not the normal letter that you're talking about, Mr. Crow. This letter is addressed to Jim Quillen as a result of my meeting with the speaker and his conference with these committee chairmen. I mean, they didn't write a letter just to, to the committee here saying they're going to hold a hearing. I mean, I'm on this. I'm on it to win, but I don't want to lose it. M m m m no. And I know, you, I know you, uh, you're going to answer me, but let me say, I don't mind myself as a member of Congress paying the additional fee. Nor do I, I, I do Mr. mind Cole. the federal employees postal employees included, paying this additional fee because it's a tax increase. Now, what do you do? You're going to fight your battle here, Mr. Frost? You give the, if, if I may, what you do, Mr. Mr. Quillen, is that you vote in favor of the Hall Amendment, and then you permit the entire House to express its will on this particular well, subject. Well, the Hall Amendment. not permitting the House to express its will, but if we reject the Hall Amendment. Well, okay, if the House had a chance to do that, but well, what I'm saying that this amendment is not going to get out of committee. It's not going to get out of committee because your side is strangling it in the crib. Well, if your side permitted it to get out of committee, I, I, I then the entire that. House would have a chance to I vote on it. I told you that I want to win the battle, not lose the fight. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, I'd be glad. So, Jim, let me just say to you, I, I, as I said, I have many of the same concerns that you have. I really believe that this matter uh, should be brought up uh, during the reconciliation bill or as a separate bill on the floor. There are many other areas that we have to re revisit, uh, dealing with uh, uh, benefits, retirement benefits, with the Social Security issues. All of that needs to be done, and I just want you to know that I pledge to you I will do everything I can to help make sure that uh, this um, that there will be a substitute for this in the bill. We can't take it out now because we would end up violating the contract. We would not be paying for the tax cuts. We cannot do that. Uh, but I will do everything I can to work with you to help you to try to resolve this situation down the road. Well, and I, I assure you there will be another vote on this issue. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Quillen has the time. And we really I, have to uh, move on here. No, no. I'm just well, saying we have, we have to, to move, move on. on. Why don't you just take a little less time in explaining things? I'd be glad to. Mr. Quillen has the time. Well, I, uh, as I say, I want to win the battle and not in the end. And I think the best course of action for us who believe in this <clears throat> is to go forward and get the job done. We can't do it here in this committee because we're going to lose. Mr. Hall. Well, Mr. Quillen, I, <clears throat> I would simply say is that this amendment is probably one of the more serious amendments of, of all the amendments we're offering because <clears throat> we're doing the same thing here in the Rules Committee that we did with the WIC amendment that I offered and the school lunch program, where a program was eliminated without a debate on the floor of the House, and this program had been in business uh, and very successfully for 50 years. That's the first thing I would say. 
The committees met on this. They decided they couldn't vote on it because they didn't have the votes. So it's going to come up here. There's going to be, what, a 9-4 to four vote here. It's going to go to the floor of the House. You can't get at this on the floor of the House. It's over. The second thing I want to say is to the chairman is that this is not, you said this is being construed as a tax increase. In fact, it is. <clears throat> this is a tax increase. This is a 2.5% payroll tax increase for all federal employees. It's also a 4% cut in benefits for, for retirees. So it is that. And the fact is that we have a CS, CRS report here that says that we, we pay out $36 million per year and we take in $63 million. So this program is paying for itself. It's a very, very good program. And it's a, we're talking about real people here. In the contract of America, we talk about, we don't say federal workers, we say bureaucrats, or you say bureaucrats. We're talking about real people here. We're talking about people that are going to pay for this tax, uh, tax decrease. The federal workers are going to pay for it. They're always, they always get the short end of the stick. We always attack them. They're always attacked by every administration. They are always called bureaucrats. The fact is, these people keep the government going. They're going to get a tax increase, this, and we can't get at it because you won't let us. You're doing the same thing you did with the WIC program and the school lunch program. There's going to be no debate on the floor of the House, no vote, no way to get at this if we don't allow it in this rule. Mr. Mr. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd, like to, I'd be glad to you. I'd like to insert in the record the letter I received from you. Is that the one from the speaker, Jim? Make part. Is that the one you got from the speaker? I don't have a letter from the speaker. I met with him personally. It's from Mr. Kasich, and without objection, it is uh, will appear in the record. Mr. Hall, are you? Uh, I asked uh, for the gentleman to yield, and he yielded to me, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, so, actually, Mr. Hall, what you're saying is this will be the only recorded vote that will be taken by anybody in the Congress on this matter. No. I don't know what they'll do in the Senate, uh, Mr. Mobley. I have no idea, but I know what they did on the WIC program and the school lunch program. There was never a debate. They got rid of a program and been in existence for 50 years. Everybody said it was good, both Republicans and Democrats. There was never a, a vote, never a debate. We never did that in the Rules Committee when you were chairman. <coughs> never. It's never been done before. Mr. Chairman, one other comment, and that's all. I want to win the battle. I know what the vote will be in this committee. And I think that I, uh, that I can work with the Speaker and with the, uh, Mr. Solomon and others to try to salvage our loss in this committee and win the battle. So therefore, I think it would be good judgment for me to go along and try to win rather than lose. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I may just add one well, brief comment. You get the time for Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall, if I'm... I'd be glad to yield to Mr. Frost. <laughs> uh, Mr. Quillen, uh, there are burdens of being in the majority, and I think that uh, your side is uh, realizing the burden of being uh, having the majority vote in this House, and that uh, I would only repeat to you that um, what we do here does matter and uh, you're the chairman of the uh, budget committee may have uh, all the good intentions of the world uh, but he may be left behind in this process uh, if this bill is passed and becomes law and um, I, I th this is not an idle matter and and both you and the chairman have raised the issue of members of Congress all of us who are members of Congress will abide by whatever changes are made in the federal retirement system. If the federal retirement system is changed through an orderly process by the Committee of Jurisdiction and the contribution is increased, of course we'll pay an increased contribution. That's not an issue here. No one is suggesting that members of Congress should not uh, pay exactly what everybody else pays. We'll do that. What we are suggesting is that this be done in an orderly process by the Committee of Jurisdiction and it not be done by behind closed doors and without a vote on the floor. Mr. Uh, Mr. Hall, yield uh, one, uh, one other statement. I, you said the uh, chairman of the budget committee. Mr. Casey. Uh, the, the letter signed by Bill Kling, uh, Klinger, the uh, chairman of the committee of jurisdiction, he held some hearings. The bill did not get out of committee, but he's going to hold additional hearings. Well, Mr. Quillen, 
as you know, uh, uh, the horse is out of the barn, and this is closing the door after the bar after the horse has left. Well, we really uh, must move on. And um, just would, one last thing, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hall, I, I have a memorandum that was prepared by CRS uh, asking some of the questions about unfunded liability and some of the questions that came up that you mentioned. And the fact is that, that CRS uh, says that. This uh, federal civil service retirement program is in very good shape. I'd like to submit it for the record if I could. Without objection. Any further discussion on the amendment? Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Dreyer. Let me just briefly make a couple of uh, <clears throat> points here. First of all, there seems to have been a little confusion over a statement that Mr. Frost made. This measure does not in any way affect retirees. It affects federal workers. I think that clarification must be made. And second, to argue that we are somehow going to totally avoid this issue is, I think, way off base because there has been great concern by more than a few members within our conference on this question, Mr. Solomon being one of them, obviously Mr. Quillen, and uh, this issue is not going to pass by. This will not be the only opportunity for us to address it. <clears throat> and as Mr. Quillen has said, uh, this is not just a letter to anyone, it's a letter to Jim Quillen. And in light of that fact, uh, I think we can all rest assured that this is something that will continue on the front burner. But as Mr. Solomon said too, we are proceeding under a modified closed rule, which is the precedent that has been set by previous Congresses under your majority control. And it seems to me that we have a responsibility to do this. It was uh, deliberated. Uh, by a number of people, and I believe that we're going to continue to see debate raging on, and I hope very much that we can defeat this and proceed. Uh, is there further discussion? Uh, I, uh, just to could respond I, uh, Mr. Dry. For, before you do, uh, is there, are there other members that wish to be heard that have not spoken? Yeah, Mr. McGinnis. Briefly, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hall made the remarks that, and I don't recall this, that when we had the uh, school lunch program and the uh, uh, WIC program that we voted to eliminate them. We never voted to eliminate those programs. The vote up here was dealing with block grants and so on. Those programs weren't eliminated. And I think that that comment needs to be correct. Well, the fact is, uh, the fact is that they, it says in, in your legislation that the states may have it. It doesn't say they shall have it. Yeah, but your statement was they were eliminated by a vote in this committee. And I'm just correcting we, you we since have, you uh, put fact, it on TV. We in fact, <laughs> eliminated. We, in fact, eliminated the chance to even vote on it. Mr. And Chairman. they, in fact, can be eliminated from all 50 states if the states want to. They can eliminate them right now. We never had a debate on it, never had a vote on it. Mr. Chairman. Well, the fact is that not one school lunch across this country is going to be eliminated, and I think that your statement implies otherwise. Uh, I, I like this. One, I like uh, to wait and see that and happen in uh, about six okay, months. Okay, let's, uh, one quick statement. Mr. Quillen. I can't find that amazing. If your side over there thought so much of this amendment as I do, why didn't Mr. Gephardt include it in his substitute? You certainly could have had a vote on it. I mean, did you do your work with your own leadership? Are you trying to do the work in the, in the committee here when you only have four votes? Gentlemen, yield. Side. Jim, yield. Yeah. There's nothing in here about federal employees. That's why the, the <coughs> Gephardt didn't put any... Well, I, uh, I mean, he could do it. he get a waiver to do it. If I might, uh, with the gentleman yield, and then we really have to move on, but uh, I have the, uh, the Gephardt Amendment uh, before me. Uh, it's uh, a thick document. Uh, the document was not filed until noontime today. It was accompanied by no explanation or summary, nor was one given to us after we twice requested it. The substitute has grown from 36 pages to 98 uh, pages in just five days, including the addition of, uh, of three new titles. I really don't know what is in this bill. And, the Gephardt uh, the substitute uh, does strike this provision because it's not contained well, in the Gephardt substitute to answer again, your question. I, if Mr. Gephardt had given us a uh, summary of his, uh, of his bill, perhaps we would, you know, we would know that. Mr. I mean, I Chairman? take your word for it. 
Mr. Moakley. You didn't ask Mr. Gephardt for a summary when, when he was oh, before us. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yes, we did. No, no, uh, you In didn't. Personal conversations with uh, Mr. Gephardt, uh, when uh, he with staff. Uh, we wanted to be able to see their substitute, Joe. But when he testified here, he's, the, 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 he wasn't asked uh, and he wasn't required to. And uh, I'm sure if you wanted it, we could have worked the thing out. Well, next time uh, we want it, so I'll tell you in advance. For next Chairman, year. Mr. Chairman, if I could just uh, make a final 30 seconds. Then we have to move on. Uh, Mr. Dreyer has uh, suggested that he now has, uh, people have had conversations with the Speaker and their representations on that side of the aisle and that everything is going to be hunky-dory. Uh, I would just remind my friend from California that the opening day of the session, uh, the, uh, the Speaker and back in November also said that there would be open rules granted by this committee and it didn't turn out that way. I would just say, um, as long as we're on this, this subject, and then we absolutely have to move on, but in, in the Gephardt substitute, as I've been able to, uh, to discern it, uh, at least the, uh, the Republican language in the Republican bill uh, does equalize congressional uh, pension benefits with those of federal retirees. As you know, we do have special benefits. We do have early retirements. We, uh, uh, the benefits are much more lucrative than they are in the federal. And we are, we are in this legislation, I might just point out, equalizing those so that they are no better than any other federal employee of any kind. Uh, if there's no further discussion on the, uh, on the amendment, who offered this amendment in the first place? Mr. Hall. <laughs> on the Hall amendment two hours ago, uh, all those in favor of the Hall Amendment will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. Nay. And the amendment is not agreed to. Is a roll call requested? A roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Will it? Mr. Chairman, uh, I think it would be a good idea for me personally trying to win the battle to go along with the leadership. Therefore, I vote no. Will it vote no, Mr. Breyer? No. Dreyer votes no, Mr. Goss. Goss votes no, Mr. Linder. Linder votes no, Mr. Price. No. Mr. Price votes no, Mr. Diaz. No. Mr. Diaz Pilar votes no, Mr. Diaz. No. Mr. Dennis votes no, Mr. Walt votes no. Mrs. Walt votes no, Mr. Mobley. Yes. Mobley votes yes. Mr. Beals, yes. Mr. Beals votes yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Hall. Yes. Mr. Hall votes yes. Mr. Solomon. No. The clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Might I call attention that uh, the hour is getting late. Uh, Mr. Moakley, uh, you complain about the late hours. and uh, I never complain uh, about the late hours. <laughs> oh, yes, hours. you did. We have you on record. <laughs> I complain about Christ. When I was chairman, we used to meet until 2 o'clock in the morning. Christ. If, uh, see, yeah. now, you, now you know why they call me affable. Uh, if, uh, if I might just suggest that uh, many of the other amendments, uh, many of them are minor, perhaps we could in block them. And, uh, I have three amendments left. To in block? Well, why not, Joe? I have some in blocks, but. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Mr. Hall, you're recognized. I have. Any in block? I have a. No, I have actually three more amendments, but uh, this amendment shouldn't take very long. Well, it's then. amendment number 22. It's offered by Representative Price and yourself, Mr. Solomon. Uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, this is an amendment that provides for a tax credit equal to 50% of the expense incurred by an employer to provide licensed on-site uh, dependent child care. It, it, it seems like a very good amendment. It, uh, it's an amendment that I certainly support and encourages businesses to provide on-site uh, child care services to employees. Apparently studies have shown that the increases uh, as a result of this, that increased productivity and morale reduces absenteeism among employees. And uh, I think uh, Congresswoman Price cited many good examples of how it's worked at different companies, so I offer it as, uh, as an amendment to this bill. Oh, Mrs. Price always has good ideas. Mrs. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Hall, for your support. I do agree that it is a great amendment, but I am convinced now that it's not the right time to integrate this into our tax code, and I uh, uh, don't think that I will even support my own amendment. I would like to see it uh, come up uh, a freestanding separate bill after full hearings, and perhaps we can even make it better. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I hope the gentlelady, if she introduces the bill in bill form, I would like to be one of your lead sponsors and uh, do everything we could to help you get the legislation through the Congress. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. And I think you'd uh, fare well before the Rules Committee. <laughs> I would hope that be the case. Thank you.
Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the <coughs> whose amendment? Oh. Of the Hall amendment will say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. Oh. The amendment is not agreed to. The amendment is not agreed to. Roll call is requested. Clerk will call the roll. To. Are there further amendments to come before the body? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moakley. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee make an order on amendment number 25 offered by Representative Kletzker and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. Where is that on your number 25. 14. 14 the, bottom, that's right. the amendment requires that the use of federal <laughs> offices for regular lodging purposes by members of Congress be treated as taxable employee benefits. That's the Army amendment. Boy, I've heard of everything. Oh, you haven't? I haven't. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman, Congress... Congress recently passed legislation requiring members of this body to live by the laws it passes. Current law allows an exemption from taxation from, for employee-provided housing if three conditions are met. It must be for the convenience of the employer, it must be f furnished on the premises, and it must be a condition of employment. Members of the Congress who use their federal office space for lodging satisfy only the second condition. And I believe that it is only fair for members of Congress to pay taxes on a benefit that would be taxable if they were in the private sector. Therefore, I ask that, that the outrageous. committee make... This is outrageous. I'm sorry, I didn't know my mic was... <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, we've been... I'm going to tell you why it is in a minute. Go ahead. Okay. I ask that the committee be made in order. Mrs. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with all due respect to our ranking member, I, I believe, Mr. Chairman, many of our new members, many of them with small children at home, um, who are willing to suffer the indignities of sleeping on their sofa uh, two or three nights a week when they happen to be in town, uh, certainly don't deserve any worse. And I, I consider these folks American heroes, if, if nothing less. Mr. Chairman, I think that the uh, gentleman's motion should be defeated. Mr. Chairman. Well, I just have to say a couple of words about this, because, you know, um, I just have to go back 16 years ago when I came to this Congress with you, Mr. Frost, and, uh, you, you know, I had five teenage kids ready to go to college. And in the next five years, they all went to college. I had four in college at one time. You want to know what that means? You know, that's about a $75,000 outlay per year. And I slept in my office night after night after night to try to pay the damn bills. And I've never heard of such a, so I get too excited, I better not talk anymore about this. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, Frost. As, as the chairman Frost. knows, we currently pay taxes on the value of our parking over a certain Absolutely. amount. Right. And if we're going to pay taxes on the value of our parking, I don't understand why we wouldn't pay taxes on the value of our offices used for lodging purposes. I, I don't understand. Does that why mean if we sleep in our cars, we're okay? Well, you're already paying taxes. You're already paying oh, taxes on only your parking. Only if the motor's purposes. running. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell just, you. If you're, if you're looking for a, if you're looking for a logical explanation, uh, we are being subject to tax on the value of the parking privileges that we currently have in, our, in the various garages in this building. Any further discussion on this uh, amendment? Well, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mowgli. Uh, that's. That is uh, the current uh, status today. I understand that you cannot sleep in your office. No, in the gym. The, in the gym? Well, what do you mean you can't sleep in your office? <laughs> I mean, I mean overnight. I mean, what you do between five and eight is all right with me. Oh, <laughs> Anyway, too late. no, I, I think that you're giving members uh, an additional uh, perk, if you want. Oh, look at this. Here's a Congress that subjected itself to every other uh, 
a, a perk that's on the outside. We, if they get taxed on the outside, we should get taxed. If they're paying for parking, we should get parking. Now, th th someone said you can't sleep in your office. Now, as a big ground goes up, and I, I, I just don't discern the difference. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to a hockey game on Friday night. I'm going to walk around between periods. I'm going to ask anybody if they, if they don't like me sleeping in my office, and if they tell me not to, I won't do it anymore. Anyone? With or without a tax break. Any more, huh? Uh, uh, yes. Mr. Bulkley, is your next amendment that we have to pay the water bill and then flush our commotion? Well, I'm getting ready for the battle. I'm going to put my uniform on and vote with the leadership because I'd like to win a battle around here once in a while. <laughs> is there any further discussion? If not, uh, all those in favor of this uh, memo say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there roll further call. amendments? Are you kidding? Yeah, no, I'm not kidding. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Clerk, call Mr. Dreyer. Mr. Dreyer, vote Mr. Gosselin. I want to see what you can tell me. Mr. Dreyer, vote Mr. Gosselin. No. It's your question. No. Mr. Dreyer, vote Mr. McGinnis. No. Mr. McGinnis, vote Mr. Gosselin. Mr. Waldo. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yes. <laughs> absolutely yes. Mr. Beals, yes. Mr. Beals votes yes. Mr. Cross. Yes. Mr. Cross votes yes. Mr. Hall votes yes. Mr. Yes. Hall votes yes. Chairman Soller. No. Soller votes no. The clerk will announce the results. Four yeas, nine nays. <laughs> the amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Moakley has left, but I was then going to invite you all into my office right through there where Jackie Judd is standing and uh, let you see the indentations in the couch in there. <laughs> Joe's just mad because I took over his couch. Are there any further Mr. amendments? Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, an amendment in order, number eight. It's offered by Representative Bunning, and uh, this is the amendment that you asked earlier this this has to do with uh, adoption credits and it seems like a good amendment uh, mr bunning uh, told us a few days ago that his family had adopted several children and so he has a great deal of knowledge about the challenges and the costs that are involved and uh, it seems like a, a very good amendment relative to helping to fray some of the cost of people that are very generous and compassionate about adopting children. So I offer the amendment for discussion and for a vote. Well, Mr. Hall, uh, you know, I'd ask if this was going to be put in block with the, uh, with the other amendment uh, by Ms. Mr. Kennedy uh, in order to save some time because they are similar, as you know, dealing with the same subject, and we could have been blocked them and saved some time. What is this? <laughs> Uh, I found him sleeping in Solomon's locker. <laughs> that, that's a Boston lobster. Um, Bring me a hot <laughs> Oh, jeez. <laughs> Would you pass that thing down or no, something? No, no, bring it over here. Bring it over here. <laughs> If you take the bands off it, it'll bite them. If you take the bands off it, it'll bite you, so be careful. You can't take it home with you. It's already spoken for. Where did this guy come from? Who is this? It's a Maine lobster. It's a Maine lobster. I just want to bet with them on the hockey game. Yeah, we bet Maine. I'll be up and see you in Maine, okay? Okay, well, I'll save it for you. Okay. Okay. I think we'd better move on. All in favor of the Hall Amendment will say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Nay. The amendment is not agreed to. Are Roll there call, further Mr. amendments Mr. to the um, resolution? Mr. Bulkley, turn off your microphone or offer an amendment. I have, I have the next so, amendment. But he offered oh, for roll call. Yes, oh, Tony, call. you just had. We're going. Roll quickly. call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Willis, no. Willis votes no. Mr. Dreyer 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 Price goes no. No. Price goes no. The other price goes no. 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 Yes. 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 No. The clerk will announce the results. <clears throat> the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further in block amendments to be offered? Mr. Chairman, I have two individual amendments. I will talk fast, though. Well, could you offer them in block? 
No, they're really? it's entirely different subjects. Well, Mr. Chairman, my Republican colleagues on this committee have, have said repeatedly that the tax bill restores equity to our senior citizens by raising high. the earnings test for Social Security. Which two are they? Uh, yet this legislation specifically delinks earnings of the blind from this increase in the earnings exemption. This link has been in effect since 1977 and has provided the very same kind of incentive for blind persons to seek work and to contribute to our society. Oh. I offer an amendment by Mrs. Kennelly, which increases the earnings exemption for the blind, as the bill does for seniors. Mr. Chairman, I think if we are going to use the tax bill to restore equity to seniors, it should, it should not then be used to take it away from citizen, another class of citizens in this country. Both Mrs. Price and Ms. Waldholz are co-sponsors of a resolution spo uh, sponsored by Mrs. Kennelly on this very subject, and I would hope that they could join with me in supporting this amendment. I move adoption of the amendment. Mrs. Zenit, Walholtz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as the gentleman pointed out, I'm very sympathetic to this. Uh, I think it's time that this government quit punishing work, uh, an initiative, even if that initiative is simply sleeping in your office if you're a member of Congress. I think there are too many instances in, in, in which we are punishing people for, for valiant efforts. Uh, I do believe, though, that we can address this, not in this bill, but as a separate bill, as we go through restructuring the tax code. And at that point, I'm sure Mrs. Price and I will join with any of the others who are interested in trying to make this change. Our commitment in the contract was to help seniors. We're trying to meet that in this contract. This is not the end of making changes in the tax code. And I would just suggest we do it at the appropriate time, which I think is not in this bill. Is there further discussion to the amendment? If not, uh, all those in favor of the amendment will say aye. aye. All those opposed will say nay. Aye. And the amendment is not agreed to. Roll call. Uh, roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Roll call. Yes. 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 No. The clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments yes. to the resolution? Yes. Mr. Chairman. Well, I have uh, one, one additional amendment, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Uh, Frank. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have an amendment. Uh, as we're very aware, the House has passed a conference oh. report on H.R. 831, oh. which provides a 25% health insurance premium deduction for the self-employed. I would like to offer an amendment to the rule which would provide for the consideration of an amendment by Mr. Pomeroy. The Pomeroy amendment increases the self-employed deduction to 80 percent and will allow, will also allow employees who are ineligible to participate in their employer's health plan to deduct up to 80 percent of their health insurance premiums. This amendment is only a matter of fairness. Under the current law, Businesses allowed to deduct 100 percent of the cost of health insurance. Many of the individuals who are affected by this amendment are family farmers. They are self-employed to be sure, but they are certainly running a business. I think this amendment provides a logical step toward offering small businessmen and women who are technically self-employed equity in the health in health care. I have a letter from the Farm Bureau to you, Mr. Chairman, urging that this amendment be made in order. I would like to submit it and a letter from the National Association of the Self-Employed for the record. In this letter, the Farm Bureau estimates that the Pomeroy Amendment would help 2.7 million individuals who filed for the 25 percent deduction last year. The letter also points out uh, of this 2.57 million, 67 percent had incomes under $50,000. Allowing them to deduct 80 percent of their health care would certainly make it more affordable. This increase in the deduction for the self-employed and the addition of other non-insured employees would cost will cost $2.6 billion over five years. This cost is offset in the Pomeroy Amendment by lowering the income eligibility for the $500 per child tax credit from $200,000 to between $55,000 and $80,000. That reduction provides savings of $2.7 billion, $27.3 billion. Mr. Chairman, this is a serious amendment affecting millions of Americans, and the House deserves the opportunity to consider it. I move adoption of the amendment. <laughs> well, I'll just say to the uh, gentleman that uh, certainly there is merit to this concept. Uh, this is a concept that I had uh, proposed uh, back when uh, President uh, and Mrs. Clinton were proposing what I considered to be a totally socialized medicine program that would have been a, uh, a bigger disaster uh, that, uh, than, we could under, than we could believe. 
Uh, it is, uh, it is meritorious, and I believe that it ought to be taken up along with the other health care provisions that we're going to be uh, holding hearings on and uh, later on enacting uh, this year and early next year. And uh, I would uh, hope that we could do it right now. Again, we would be opening up the tax code, and I don't think we can afford to do that in this particular piece of legislation. Any further discussion on the amendment? If not, uh, all so those in favor, uh, Mr. Moakley? Oh. I'm not trying to rush you, but go ahead. Did you want to discuss the amendment? No, I'm sorry. I thought you wanted to open up for new amendments. Oh. Mr. Moakley. Oh, thank you. you know, we, haven't, we haven't had the vote yet. Oh, I'm, I, I didn't hear your call for a vote. That's why he I didn't, didn't know. He, did, he didn't call for the vote Oh, yet. all right. I thought the gentleman had withdrawn his amendment based yeah. on my uh, very good argument. I wish you wouldn't <laughs> sleep in your office. On <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor of the Frost uh, proposal will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. No. Yeah, evidently, the nays have it, no, and the amendment call. is not agreed roll to, call. and a roll call is requested, and the clerk will call the roll again. No. 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 Yes. 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 No. Clerk will announce the results. And the motion uh, amendment is not agreed to. Uh, may I inquire as to how many more motions there might be? Uh, seven. Seven? Seven more? I have one. They'll, they'll go fast. fast. They'll go fast, Mr. Chairman. We just uh, received just... a call from downstairs, and they uh, we're, we're paying overtime to the staff down there now to wait for us. Tell them they can sleep on my couch. Okay. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, if Send the word we down. started the hearing earlier, we might, we might be finished. That's right. But we'll certainly keep that in mind. How about 6 o'clock in the morning the next time? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Moakley. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure that the people out there know that we do have very difficult skirmishes, but we also enjoy a little back and forth. But I just have to tell you that last year, when I was chairman of the Rules Committee, we took roll calls on 500 amendments before the Rules Committee. We did? Yeah, we did. And I didn't once say, hurry up. Okay? Wow. How are you? Anyway, that's just one thing. Who's uh, me? I've not said a word for an hour and a half, Mr. That's Chairman. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman, am I recognized? Well, I'm just going to tell you how many we have last uh, two in the two years. Five hundred. Five hundred. Well, we're, we've we've only been here a hundred days, and we've already up to 133. Oh. I think we're going to break that record. Yeah, but we're not in a matter of weeks. But but we, we haven't reported out anything. Everything gets killed here. Oh, I see. We, we had some real good stuff coming out last year. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you've been eating too many lobsters, but Mr. Bielenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee make an order the amendment number 21 offered by Representatives Wyden, Morella, Regula, and Kennedy of Massachusetts and ask the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The amendment adds consumer protection provisions for long-term care insurance contracts. Mr. Chairman and, and, and members, just very, very briefly, this, this bill, this tax relief bill of 1995, so-called, induces people to buy long-term care insurance by providing favorable tax treatment for premiums on those policies. Yet the bill does nothing to protect consumers from the abuses that are known to be present in the market. The immediate past president of the of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners has stated, and I quote him, that uh, some consumer abuses are so severe as to raise questions about the very viability of this product, end of quote. So there are, there have been, there has been a lot of testimony with respect to abuses, with respect to these kinds, to these kinds of, of premiums, of these, these kinds of insurance uh, contracts, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I think we're making a serious mistake not to include these, these uh, bipartisan consumer protection provisions, and I, I ask for support of the amendment. Could the gentleman tell me how it's paid for? No, I can't tell you. You can't tell me how it's paid for? I don't think it, I don't, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's budget neutral, frankly. I don't, right. I mean, they are not, they are not onerous, they're, they're not costly provisions. Mm -hmm. They're, I mean, they're consumer yeah. protection I don't requirements find, that... Well, I think that's a matter of... Uh, of opinion, we'd have to look at that. Is it in the uh, Gephardt substitute? My opinion is that it's not. Right. I'll accept your opinion. Is it in the Gephardt substitute? I, I don't know, sir. I haven't been given a summary of it. <laughs> Let's not I, I rest that. my case. <laughs> All those in favor of the Bielenson Amendment will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. 
Nay. Oh. Amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? We really want another vote. Okay. Everybody else got one. Okay. <laughs> Recorded vote is requested. Clerk will call the roll. No. Yes. 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 No. <laughs> Clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are Mr. there Chairman. further amendments? Mr. Bielenson of California. Thanks. I'm, I move the committee make an order of the amendment offered, excuse me, numbered 41 offered by Re Representative Kletschka and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. Uh, the amendment stipulates that in order to qualify as a long-term care insurance contract, the contract must meet the relevant standards established in the National Association of Insurance Commissioners Long-Term Care Model Act and regulations. The, the, uh, I shan't speak any, any longer to it, Mr. Chairman, but the rationale is the same as for the last amendment, that there needs to be some protections here. And, and this, this is a non-costly one. Uh, simply requires that the, that the uh, contracts meet the, the standards, uh, the uniform national standards. Mr. diaz Ballard. Thank you, Chairman. This, this uh, amendment uh, really opens up the bill uh, quite substantially in the insurance area. Uh, I think it, uh, it perhaps may, very well may be an, a, a good amendment, but it should at least receive uh, consideration by the committees of substance and it would really open up this bill, I think, in an un unwarranted way. Is there further discussion to the uh, amendment? If not, uh, all those in favor will say aye. aye. All aye. those opposed will say nay, nay, and the amendment is not agreed to overwhelmingly. Well, I bet it's going to be about the same as the others. Roll call. Clerk will call the roll. the results and the amendment is not agreed to are there further amendments to the resolution yes, yes mr. chairman I have an amendment uh, who sought uh, mr. Oh, mr. Frost is recognized I offer the Evans amendment number 33 which raises 23.5 billion dollars in revenue over five years by removing tax preferences for multinational corporations and foreign investors these savings are earmarked in the amendment for deficit reduction mr. chairman I may not agree totally with mr. Evans amendment but I do think his proposal is a serious one and one that deserves the attention of the full House. If the savings in this legislation are going to be used to pay for these tax cuts, then we will all have to find other ways to reduce the deficit. Mr. Evans has proposed an amendment which provides significant savings and is certainly worthy of consideration. I move the amendment. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Linder. I oppose the amendment on the grounds that those examination of, the, of those issues should come within the full reform and overhaul of our IRS laws that Chairman Archer has proposed doing for later in the year. Is there further discussion to the amendment? If not, all those in favor will say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Aye. And the amendment is not agreed roll, to. Roll call, uh, roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Yes. 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 No. The clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Bielenson again. Thank you. Would Thank you turn off the microphone of your next door neighbor there? Thank I have two unblock amendments, and we have two others, and then we'll all oh, be done. Well, you are certainly recognized to offer two in block amendments. Thank you. Um, I move the committee make an order amendment number 35 re offered by Representative Strupak, amendment number 18 offered by Representative Schiff, and amendment number 9 offered by Representatives Nadler and Lowy and ask that the amendments be given the appropriate waivers. These all have to do, as you may see from the list in front of you, Mr. Chairman and, and colleagues, 
with the alternative minimum tax. And these are, as I said, an this is a, an on-block amendment. This two-pack amendment strikes subtitle C, which calls for a phase-out of the alternative minimum tax for corporations. Mr. Schiff's amendment would scale back the elimination of the alternative minimum tax by proposing reduction of 18 percent instead of 20 percent. And the nadler Lowy amendment restores the pre-1993 tax level on Social Security benefits immediately and restores the corporate minimum tax provisions. Additional funds not used for offsets would go to deficit reduction. What, one of the portions, uh, very briefly, Mr. Chairman, members, that uh, of your proposed tax relief bill, so-called, that, that offends and worries many of us is the, is the doing away mainly through the, the elimination of the alternative minimum tax of taxes on a number of corporations, which, again, I think will find themselves in a position within a year or two of not paying any taxes. And I think, and I mean this sincerely, I think it's going to be an embarrassment to all of us when they start publishing lists, again, of huge corporations, profitable corporations which are paying no taxes. Whether or not it's fair, it certainly doesn't sound fair or reasonable to the American people. And I suspect at the time we're going to be we'll scramble back and try to do something about doing something. What we did last time was to put in this alternative minimum tax. And I, I think it's uh, I think we're making a mistake, frankly, to take it out at this time. And that's that's in one way or another that these various amendments would, would speak to. That was a much more articulate explanation of the amendment than, uh, than the one you had before. I commend you. Mr. McGinnis. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman, I oppose the amendment. I uh, hear what the uh, gentleman from California is saying, but frankly, I think it's important to remember that not every corporation is a big corporation. In my small towns, people have a lot of incorporations, and they're very, very small. I think this is the type of thing that needs to be addressed in great detail by the Ways and Means Committee, and I think that's the appropriate place. In addition, I'm not sure if it's in the Gephardt deal, the package that he put up. So I think until we find out that, I'd urge a no vote on the amendment. Gentlemen's points are well taken. Not further well, discussion. Not, not entirely well taken. The, no? I, I say this is not personal. Is, is Don't it, get excited. Is it in the Gephardt bill? I, have, I haven't seen the Gephardt bill, Mr. Chairman. I didn't see it before. Would somebody please yeah, give him okay, the Gephardt bill? No, the answer is uh, that he doesn't touch the alternative okay. tax. Okay. And, and I understand what you're saying, but the, the, tr the truth of the matter, I say to our friend from Colorado, is that, that, that there was not given, you know, that there was not a lot of thought given nor nor extensive hearings held by the, the Committee of Jurisdiction, the Ways and Means Committee, on getting rid of the alternative tax. And I'm only suggesting, I mean this, you know, it's going to come back to haunt us, and, and I, I wish we'd go a little more slowly on this, and maybe they can fix it up over there. Although, as Mr. Frost correctly pointed out, and Mr. Hall earlier, this is our only vote on it. Anyway, I think it's a really pretty good amendment, as the Chairman suggested, and I'd like us to vote for it. Is there further discussion? If not, uh, all those in favor of the Bielans and the amendment will say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. Oh. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there roll further call. amendments? Yes, uh, like roll, roll call is requested. Call. The clerk will call the roll. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No. The clerk will announce the results. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further yes. amendments, uh, hopefully, in, in block? Mr. Chairman, yes. This is Good. an unblock amendment. Which Mr. Bielans. Five of the amendments. Includes five of the amendments. Five amendments. Before the gentleman. Um, I move the committee make an order amendment number six, offered by Mr. Trafficant. Amendment number seven, offered by Representative Meehan. Amendments numbered 16 and 17 offered by Representative Schiff, and amendment number 32 offered by Representative Abercrombie, and ask that the amendments be given the appropriate waivers. These all have to do, Mr. Chairman, with the capital gains tax changes in the bill. Mr. Trafficant's amendment reduces capital gains tax rates to 10 percent with the condition that proceeds from sale or exchange must be used to buy government securities within 60 days. Government security must be held for at least three years. The Mian Amendment reduces the individual and corporate capital gains tax rates on the stock of domestic manufacturers. The Schiff Amendments eliminate the indexing for inflation except for capital gains and place a maximum six-month holding requirement for all capital gains recognition. And finally, the Abercrombie Amendment increases the one-time exclusion for the sale of a primary residence from $125,000 to $250,000 and increases the holding period from three years to five years. Uh, although the gentleman might well argue and perhaps be correct that, that um, it's difficult to take up these things, you know, individually, I think the members, if they, if they listen carefully, will recognize that two or three, maybe all four of these are, are, pretty, are pretty good amendments and things which, if we had a chance to vote for, 
uh, with, with most of us would like to vote for, so I commend them to the member's attention. Well, I'd like to hear the Secretary of the Treasury's uh, feelings on this issue. No hearings have ever been held, and it'd be interesting. And I'd um, his I'd, feelings would probably be the same as why don't we invite him to that. come before us sometime and talk to us, Mr. McGinnis? Well, Mr. Chairman, again, I've looked at this as I have the uh, previous amendments, and I voiced much the same concerns. Number one, don't know if they're in Gephardt's deal. Uh, number two, I think it ought to go back to. Well, I don't know, Mr. Valenson. You I haven't do. seen it yet, have you? Yes. Well, actually, no, I would, yes. No, if they're not in his. You're informed by staff that there's nothing there. Well, sometimes the staff is right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, your staff is right. Um, and furthermore, I think that uh, this should have been uh, handled in ways and means to go back to ways and means. I just urge you no vote. No further discussion. Uh, all those in favor of the Bielenson amendments in block will say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. No. Nay. No. And the amendment is not agreed to. A roll call is requested, and the clerk will call the roll. Is that it? All done? No. 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 Yes. 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 No. The clerk will announce the results. The amendment is not agreed to. I'm informed there are two further amendments. Is that correct? Who's recognized? Correct. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have a and block amendment, uh, Mr. Sanders, number four, Mr. Orton, number 39. They both deal with uh, IRIS. Uh, Mr. Sanders, uh, his amendment deals with increasing the income thresholds for eligibility. And Mr. Orton, he allows individuals that have IRIS uh, to borrow or to lend their children money for the first time for the purchase of a primary residence. They seem to be very good uh, amendments. I offer them uh, un unblock and um, call for the roll on it. Any discussion on the amendments? Mr. Linder. Chairman, sure, I'm going to oppose the motion to amend the gentleman from Tennessee's resolution because of the same reasons I gave earlier. All of these things, in my judgment, should be taken up in a massive examination of the entire IRS code and an overhaul of it. It's interesting to me that if we do what Chairman Archer says and scrap our system for a uh, point-of-sale sales tax instead, none of these questions would matter. Everyone would disappear. And I oppose the motion. You've heard the uh, opposition. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the amendment will say aye. aye. All those aye. opposed will say nay. Oh. And the amendment is not agreed to. Is there one last amendment? <coughs> Give us a roll call, Mr. Chairman. The roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. No. 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 Clerk will announce the results, and uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Moakley. Mr. Chairman. Close out for the minority. The hour has finally come in which I can give you all a good bill to vote is for. Is that a song? <laughs> Would you like to sing that? Or is <laughs> this is a, a non-block, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it includes uh, Traficant number 5, Nadler number 10, Engel number 14, Foglietta, number 31, Hilliard, 38, and OB, 40. Uh, I move the committee make in order an amendment uh, containing all those bills uh, and ask that the amendments be given the appropriate waivers. The Trafficant Amendment provides a 10% domestic investment tax credit for the purchase of American-made products. The Nadler Amendment requires that tax liability be indexed to regional differences in the cost of living. The Engel Amendment allows individuals to withdraw from the American Dream savings accounts to start or expand a business. Foglietta Amendment establishes 
a deficit reduction commission to reduce farm and corporate subsidies. The Hilliard Amendment excludes from gross income interest on certain waterway facility bonds. And the OB Amendment grants the President authority to reduce the lowest income tax rate uh, during a period of low economic growth. I think uh, the people have heard these amendments before, and uh, I would like you to uh, uh, vote on them. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Well, that's very interesting. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Diaz Ballard of Miami, Florida. Thank you. Uh, most respectfully, I, I think that um, these are very uh, far reaching, uh, comprehensive, really bill gutting. Uh, uh, amendments by virtue of how comprehensive and far-reaching they are. Uh, some of them, I think, are are uh, very interesting and, and individually uh, I uh, I would support. But I think that, and some of them may be in the in, in the get get part substitute. Uh, uh, I, I still haven't seen the. See, I the, the, uh, I I feel the same way you did, but the, he wanted me to put them on blanc, so I put them on blanc. Well, I think that's one of the reasons that they should be voted down. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Now, who are you mad at? Him or me? <laughs> I thank the gentleman for making it in, in, uh, in block. <laughs> so we, we can uh, oppose it. I would request a no vote, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay. You've heard the um, <laughs> arguments. All those in favor of the Moakley amendments will say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. No. And the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the gentleman from Tennessee's motion? If not, on the motion itself, on the uh, resolution, uh, reporting the resolution, all those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed will say nay. No. no. And uh, evidently the ayes have it and the resolution is reported. A roll call, Mr. Chairman. A roll call on that? I'd like to get by the last oh. one about a roll call. You did? I didn't realize you did even. Thank, thank you very much. Clerk will call the roll on reporting the resolution. Aye. Well, on both sides, right? Aye. Right, both sides. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Goss, both sides. Aye. Lender, both sides. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, both sides. Mr. Goss, both sides. Yes. 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 And the resolution is reported. It will um, be taken up on the floor tomorrow morning uh, after one minute, the first order of, of business. And uh, Mr. Solomon will carry for the majority. Mr. Moakley will carry for Mr. Uh, Solomon. So it's going to be an interesting morning. Yeah. Uh, I might just call the attention to the membership that, uh, uh, not to punish you, but uh, tomorrow at 5 o'clock this committee will meet. Uh, we will meet on the Medicare Select uh, legislation, H.R. 483, and possibly a conference report on the Defense Supplemental Bill. Mr. Until Chairman. Mr. Uh, Quillen. I would like to point out it is now 20 minutes till 6, and everybody's hungry. I would like for Mr. Moakley to bring the lobster back. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, Jim, funny thing happened while I was in there. Someone boiled them. It, the go. lobster's gone. You know, uh, for a minute, Joe, I thought Mr. Moakley was going to invite us all out to dinner. <laughs> you heard the story about the fellow that... I think I better adjourn the meeting. Uh, <laughs> you heard the story about the fellow walks into a restaurant and asks for lobster. Are you sure you want this on the record? The clerk, the waiter comes back with the lobster with one <laughs> claw. He says, look at I ordered a lobster. He says, it's a lobster. He says, it's only got one claw. He says, they're very cannibalistic. He says, when they fight, sometimes they lose a claw. He says, how about a winner? <laughs> <laughs> this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, gentlemen. The House meets later today at 11 Eastern Time. Members will take up the Republican tax cuts legislation. You can watch live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the House of Representatives on C-SPAN. And Friday on C-SPAN, lawmakers mark the first 100 days of the 104th Congress. If the House is not in session, we'll bring you live coverage at 10 a.m. Eastern Time.